actually. Actually, this, uh, this is, can't believe it's been week eight. This is the final lesson in our uh, big story of the Bible series. I know it's been a while, but I mean, with a title like the big story, uh, you had to kind of expect it would take a while. Um, today, we're actually uh, talking about um, kind of the end of all things, uh, what happens, uh, how, how God restores everything like he promised back in Genesis 3. But before we uh, kind of jump in, I just want a, a brief reminder that uh, keep in mind that while we were off last week uh, because of uh, Thanksgiving and stuff, I want to remind you that in-person meetings uh, for youth are, are still going on um, tonight uh, from 6.30 to 7.30. And actually, we're, we'll be having our Christmas party next week. Uh, again, more details about that will be, will be going out. But uh, if you can make it, again, great. We'd love to celebrate with you. Uh, but, you know, I understand. We understand that things are kind of getting interesting again. So um, with that, you know, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And we're just going to do our best to make things happen as we can. So, um, so as I said, it's week eight. We're talking about the world restored. Let's let's jump right in, right? So, uh, I guess you could describe today as us really asking some questions and really diving into, in on those questions. And we want to start out with this kind of uh, idea or this thought, like what happens when God's um, plan uh, of re restoration uh, or redemption is completed? What about uh, when his plans or his promise, all of his promises are fulfilled? And, you know... Um, that his word is complete, you know, as the revelation comes to a close, you know, uh, what happens then, you know? Um, so kind of when we ask those questions, we want to have the understanding that his world, his creation and his people will be restored to their original, uh, and perfect condition. So maybe let's unpack that a little bit more. So, uh, the big story of the Bible ends with a new beginning. Um, God uh, will restore his, his people and his creation to uh, that perfect state uh, relationship with him, n not for a period of time, but for eternity. Um, but, as you might guess, to actually get to that point, uh, before that happens, this, this age, this time, or our understanding of this age, has to come to a close for that new um, beginning to happen for that new time that God's continued eternity must take place. So uh, quick notes, quick view uh, about studying eschatology. Yeah, I, I wondered if we should bring this up, but I think it's important because it is, it, there's no getting around it. Eschatology, big fancy word. It's basically the teaching or the study of the last days. Um, the end of time, the end of days, uh, so many ways, Armageddon, some, but that's, that's a whole, that's kind of a misnomer, that's kind of a misunderstanding, uh, Armageddon is separate, but, um, basically what, what, here, here's what you should keep in mind, I don't know why I'm stuttering, but I, it's really important that you understand that there's, there's a simplicity here, and things that we should keep in mind, eschatology, again, big fancy word, is basically a systematic Theology. So remember, theology is the teaching um, or stance of the church on a, on a subject. Um, and basically what that means is our view or our understanding of the end of time, eschatology, the end of days, um, are based on verses compiled together from all over Scripture. Uh, we do know there are, there are prophecies about the end of days. Isaiah, Daniel. Um, so we get... Our understanding of the end of days from there. We get it from the New Testament. We get it from visions that Daniel had. We get it from visions and information that John had when writing Revelation. Jesus speaks upon it. Paul alludes to it. Again, it, it, we, we take that information and we, we form as a, as, a, as a believing church what is in our understanding to take place. And that is what we need to keep in mind, that this is not just you know, it's not like we've been watching a lot of Walking Dead or anything like that. This is basically like from Scripture. And so uh, that should give us some heart because if it's based on Scripture, then it's something you and I can read about and 
and study and understand it for ourselves. Um, also, fairly put, is that we shouldn't obsess over it, but we also shouldn't neglect it. Sadly, a lot of churches do dodge away from uh, dealing with the end of days. That doesn't have to be a subject we, we forget or neglect. Um, but, because it can often lead to confusion, for some people it sounds frightening, doesn't have to be, but it can sound that way if, if that's how you present it. Um, so we shouldn't obsess over it, we shouldn't lose sleep over it, but we also shouldn't uh, forget about talking about it because that only feeds into this idea that there is confusion or that it has to be frightening. Far from it. I think we need to address it at the appropriate times. Um, and really quite part of this series, remember we're talking about foundational things. Well, this is probably the last foundational piece. So that's why we're talking about it. Um, remember also that many details about the end uh, are not simply known. And I would stress, they're not known to us. And again, I would argue with good reason that we don't need to know a lot of those things because I don't know that we'd fathom them. I don't know that we would understand them. And while we might argue, wow, I really don't understand this, this is confusing. It doesn't mean it doesn't need to happen, you know, whether we understand it or not. So um, there are things that we may not know or understand about the end. But here's what we can come away with. Ultimately, we know the story does end. Christ returns. He's victorious completely and utterly. Um, he's victorious over Satan. He establishes his kingdom um, of righteousness uh, with him when he returns, uh, and that is for eternity. So um, let's talk about the beginning of the end, right? <laughs> um, I did that really cheerily. Uh, so the last days will bring, I keep laughing about it, I don't know why. Uh, the last days will bring events unlike anything the world uh, has ever known or seen. And uh, there's, you know, there's reason for that. So often people have ignored the miraculous things that God did right in front of them. Um, this is the closing curtain. So people can't or won't be able to miss it. Um, so major events of the tribulation. So the tribulation is a, a very large component uh, within the end of days. And there are, even under that, major kind of subcategories. So events of the tribulation are often described in otherworldly terms. Uh, I want to talk about this uh, rather quickly. Uh, it's described in language, in a language, in a writing style that we would often describe as, um, like John, the Apostle John, who was once the disciple, John, considered Jesus his favorite. But as he wrote Revelation, because he was given the instruction to write Revelation, as he wrote it, he wrote it in what we, the literature style known as apocalyptic literature. Again, this is not um, John writing, again, a Le The Walking Dead or something like that. Apocalyptic literature is the style. And, you know, amongst other things, there, there's a lot of things we can say about it, but uh, those kind of writers, not just John, but those like him, um, were trying to speak out against the evil, the violence and oppression and injustice uh, that, well, as Christians faced. Uh, so they're speaking out, they're writing out against it. They were given visions, John is given visions, of a better world. Now, part of the, his other visions is how that new world, that, that perfected world comes about. Um, but he was writing about a time when there would be peace and justice. Um, and that the writings called for an allegiance to a higher authority, the higher authority, which is God, and that we should not bow down to human institutions or human might, uh, as it were, political or otherwise. So the, this idea is that they're taking on, through this writing, uh, with obviously there's a lot more purpose behind it, there's a lot more spirituality behind it, but they're trying to address the, the sin, the injustice, um, the persecution that Christians face, and what that of, out of all that, what that will lead to. Um, it is valuable to remember that the primary intent, the primary intent of Revelation, the book, 
is not to tell us about how the world ends. Again, I think that's a misunderstanding. Does it give us information? Yes. Is that its intent? No. Uh, it is to tell the persecuted Christians. It is to tell the believers um, that God will be victorious. So ultimately, while it might bring confusion or misunderstanding, perhaps fright, as you read it, or discomfort, it is not meant to do that for you or I, the believer. It is actually a book of hope. In fact, that's kind of what John says at, in the beginning of Revelation. Um, that while there may be suffering, um, it will not be in vain. It will bring about a time of peace and justice, complete and utter justice, complete and utter peace uh, for eternity. So, how does it start? Well, obviously, um, it starts off with uh, John um, being instructed to write to several churches. Each of these churches have particular issues they face. Now, I think a lot of the, the issues they face are kind of the classic tradition, uh, traditional issues we face in our churches today. Lack of faith, uh, lack of focus, uh, putting the message of the world before the message of God. And so, um, God, through John's writing, is addressing these issues. But that leads ultimately to what we to Revelation chapter six, and what we begin to see uh, the seven seals. So remember the old classic letters written out, and they had a big wax seal stamped, you know, and you had to crack open that seal to read what was inside. Um, that's what we begin to find in Revelation: is that there are seven seals. Each one brings about something else. Uh, the seals actually depict uh, actions of sinful humans against other humans. So if you're, you know, a Bible-believing, Christ-following person, and society is saying all the things that you do is wrong, and they're right, so right is wrong and wrong is right, you know, in the world's eyes, for us, as, at least, or as we see it as Christ followers, we know that truth, and yet truth has been twisted, uh, there will be persecution because of it. There will be sinful actions against Christians because of it. We see some of that in part of the world, well, we have for centuries, but we see a lot more ramping up in other parts of the world, even now. Um, so, seals one through four are that classic four horsemen of the apocalypse um, that you often hear written about or whatever. Um, but it should be noted that each uh, of these horses represents a consequence of the actions of the uh, political military um, leaders of the world. So as these military and political leaderships come together to kind of control more of the world and more of the people within the world, and again, there are, there are things out there where this is, this is happening, you know, it's, they're pretty out and about about, you know, they're, they're not making no bones about it, what they want to do. Um, so while that gets bigger and bigger and the oppression and, and, uh, persecution ramps up, the horsemen represent what they've done and what will happen to them as a result. Uh, so again, we're, we're seeing God's judgment. Keep in mind, as we read through Revelation, under, back in the Old Testament, under the New Covenant, I'm sorry, the Old Covenant, um, God said to Israel, you know, repent, 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 do right, do whole, be holy, and they never, and ultimately they didn't. There was judgment upon them, right? We talked about that a couple of lessons back, but um, that judgment was swift and complete. Now, God is not just talking to a group of people. Um, this is God judging the world on the world scale, on its complete and utter rebellion for millennia, millennia on, on millennia so here we have the seals the um following those seals um is the next phase or the next seven things and that's in revelations eight and nine and these are the trumpets so the seals depict the actions the evil actions of uh, humans upon humans uh the world against christ followers the trumpets are the beginning of God's wrath being poured out on the world. So it moves from not just the people, now it moves to the earth itself. 
and the people still living in it. Keep in mind that this is a warning. All of this, uh, you are able to read it now. Those world leaders who might be conspiring and do it, they could read Revelations and see the warning, giving them one last chance to repent. Revelation is, is that warning. It is the prophets of the Old Testament, so to, so to speak, yelling from the streets to repent, you know, change uh, your direction, or else God's wrath will come upon you. Well, the wrath has begun. Um, this is also kind of, um, kind of an ushering in, a bringing in of that time of, again, that, that figure often uh, referred to as the Antichrist. That's Revelations 13. Um, he is an agent of Satan. Now, is, is he always going to be, or potentially is he a, um, man possessed by Satan? If not at first, he certainly will be. Um, but this is someone who is acting um, through the plans that Satan is trying to enact. We see that in 2 Thessalonians 2. Um, he will have complete world political power. Maybe even political, and not just political, but military might. Uh, we know that's eventually going to be the case. Um, I don't think at first he's going to look like it. He's going to look like an answer guy. He's going to look like the go-to guy. Um... And uh, I think it will be easily and readily accepted by those who do not follow Christ. Um, or, I'll even go as far as to say, some, even some of us Christians may at first be uh, swayed by it. But eventually he will he'll always have started out as an agent of Satan. And by the end, he will certainly be one with Satan. Um, he will perform, eventually at some point, what some will call as something miraculous or something like that. Again, does Satan really have the power to do the miraculous? miraculous? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, he is not God. He is not a creator. That's why we say he will do something that it looks like way, that way. It will even convince people that perhaps he is God himself, which he will, by the way, demand to be worshipped eventually, which is something that happens uh, mentioned in Revelation 13. Um, so at some point, he will demand worship of himself. He will make himself a deity on earth. Uh, worthy of all worship. Now imagine if, uh, if you don't go that way, if you don't go his way, even more pure persecution is to come. So after all that, towards the real end, the end of ends, um, come the seven bowls. So um, that's, that's to be poured out on the earth. Um, now we call back to Noah uh, God promised that he would not destroy the earth with a flood. Well, uh, this isn't a flood. It's a bunch of bowls being poured out. All, God's compl final, complete, and, and acute wrath. Um, that's Revelation 16. So while previous judgments uh, under the trumpets were kind of limited, it was kind of strategic in what they focused on, the bowls, they go all out. They... Uh, they represent God's final judgment, and it's an destruction by God on this first earth and this this first heaven. It's all being cleansed uh, would be another way to put it. It's um, it's it is a complete another renovation, uh, you know, or not well renovation probably isn't even a right word. It's a complete another demolition because. As you recall, if uh, all of creation was tainted by that original sin, God can't be around sin. It cannot exist in his presence. So you have to rid it of all that it touched. So that's part, it's not just, yes, it's a judgment. It's a, it's a, it's a showing of where, you know, Satan's influence on all these things has, has taken place. But God is removing that completely as well to start eventually something new. Um, ultimately that brings us to the Battle of Armageddon. You've probably heard of it before, but there's, there's actually a place. It's, uh, takes, it's already been prophesied that it's going to take place in this valley, this plain called Megiddo. Um, you can go there now. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but that takes place in Revelations 16 through 19. And to boil it down, the Antichrist unites the armies of the world against uh, the armies of heaven, and 
I mean, there's no shot there. There's no chance. But I think much like his original fall from, from heaven to earth, you know, Lucifer knows this. He's trying to do something physical that he's trying to have a physical army to attack. Not because I think he plans for success. Not in the least. I think this is his complete and utter rebellious heart doing one last thing just even to the very end to show his hatred uh, for God being above him. And so um, that battle, if you want to call it that, lasts, but n not at all, uh, like that. Because that is the moment of Christ's return. Christ is described as coming down. Uh, Satan's trying to lift the tank and rockets up. And, and nothing happens because... Um, Christ's return marks the completion of God's rescue plan foretold back in Genesis 3 that we talked about when we started this series. Um, Satan's plan was never intended, I believe, like I said, never to work. It is just his last sinful act of rebellion. And with Christ returning, you know, it it kind of, uh, let's unpack it a little bit, actually. Um, his second coming will bring judgment on all humanity. Um including, obviously, Satan, but um, all humanity now will stand before Christ. Uh, John 5, Romans 14, all of them talk about that. Believers will be found justified in Christ, Romans 5. Let me read this quickly as well. Uh, this is from 2 Timothy 4.8. Uh, Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me, on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Um, a couple more things that we probably should say about Christ's uh, second coming. It means the complete and final defeat of Satan. The beast, uh, and his again, read through Revelation, you'll see the word be the beast mentioned. It's uh, not necessarily just in conjunction with Satan, it's kind of the Antichrist, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, yes, they're kind of one and the same, but again, you would have to read through it. Uh, the beast and his armies will be defeated by Christ. Uh, again, completely and utterly. Revelation 19. Satan, the beast, Antichrist, uh, and the false prophet. This would be someone in the Revelation that goes around uh, promoting the Antichrist. Perhaps being the one who says, oh, you should... Um, Worship him or else, you know, but they're all cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20. The second coming will also be, well, I should say, how should we describe <laughs> maybe the second coming? It will be physical. Acts 1.11 describes it uh, this way. He will return Christ um, in a completely physical way, just uh, as he was physically... Uh, you know, visible when he rose from the dead, physical when he ascended. Um, he will be completely and utterly visible. Um, which kind of brings us to the, the next thing. Uh, you can't miss it. The, the second coming will be so visible that you can't miss it. There's no place you will be. There's no place you can stand. Night or day, it will be completely visible by everyone. Okay, so the whole world will see this take place. It'll be sudden. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5 puts it this way. Um, it, it's described as his as him coming as a thief in the night. It'll be glorious and triumphant. Matthew 24. He came the first time as the suffering servant, so to speak, but he returns as the conquering king. Uh, in fact, when he comes down, as Antichrist is trying to make this battle, he's described as being on horseback, uh, full of glory and majesty. It, you know, he's, he's reconquering king, and, you know, um, his, his glorious presence is undeniable. Uh, Revelation 1, 7 says this, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, Amen. So, that takes place, defeat of Satan, judgment of humanity, 
just you know uh, believers being justified but then that brings us to the new heaven and the new earth um and the the end is like the beginning uh, god's kingdom where we established um on earth and he will restore his people and his creation to their original state of perfection um eternities we talked about the church is is made up of the believer uh, of those who have christ Eternity is for those who have believed. Um, living in the new Jerusalem, because there's no need for the old one, um, Revelation 21, we will live in the city of God with God himself. Um, we will have perfect fellowship with God. Um, as promised throughout Scripture, throughout Scripture, uh, God will be our Emmanuel. Uh, translated Emmanuel means God with us. That's Ezekiel 37. Uh, and so what that means is, we no longer have to try and uh, listen quietly for God as we try to struggle to do here on earth. We will be in his presence. We will see him and know him. Um, because now, because of that, that sin, that influence of sin on, on us, on our creation, prevents that. Um, it will be the end of death, suffering, and pain. Revelation 21. Uh, sin and everything associated with it will come, uh, will be gone forever. Um, it'll be gone forever um, so we won't be uh, have our minds divided by these things we will not um, dwell or worry um, we will have no need of that and I'll just kind of end this lesson and this series with this passage um, Revelation 21 5 and he who is seated on the throne said behold I am making all things new um, I hope my, I hope your takeaway, I know my takeaway has, at least with this lesson, um, was that there is hope in the suffering, that there can be joy in the trials. And we experience that in some small ways here and there, uh, in our daily or weekly or monthly walk, uh, or from year to year. But, uh, the things we think we know or understand now, they, they may change in those last days. Uh, and again, it doesn't have to be a frightening thing. In fact, if we have Christ, we should draw hope from it. Now, if you're wondering, how can you have that hope? Well, talk to, <laughs> come talk to me. Come talk to Pastor Glenn or any of the other um, very loving and dedicated people here at the church uh, who volunteer or, or do whatever. But the point is, is that this lesson, um, this series, was... Leading, about to, leading up to the point of who Christ is and what he does for us. And while there will be an end of all things, and we, will, we who have Christ will dwell with him forever, we, we need to go through, there needs to be a time where we have to enter through all that through time, just like God used time, as we saw, to bring about that, the beginning part of his restoration plan, which is phase one was bring Jesus and let him preach on the earth. Phase two is him coming down to finalize that. Um, but again, as we close this, I hope your big takeaway is that um, draw closer to Christ more than anything else. Don't, you, don't do it because of fright. Don't do it because of fear of the unknown, of the end of days or whatever. Do it because um, you know it is truth and it is life. And so with that, I, I pray that while this lesson, uh, it's deep, it's a, it's a lot to take in, um, but keep striving for understanding, keep striving to grow deeper, and if you do that, you will. And so I hope you have a blessed day, and we'll talk to you later. Bye.